Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to our um, next installment of the Spring 2021 Master Beef Producer, Tennessee Master Beef Producer webinar series. I uh, have an exciting one uh, this evening, one I've been uh, looking forward to quite a bit. Um, and I want to leave plenty of time for that and for our speaker to pr present and for to have a few Q&A at the end. And uh, in light of that, I'm going to go ahead and move fairly quickly through our introduction. I think most everybody that's signed on uh, will have been at one of the other two, one of the two previous uh, webinars and, and have a pretty good handle for how it's working tonight. But just want to uh, remind you of a few things here as we get started. Um, so one thing to uh, remember is that uh, you know we're doing this in conjunction with the U.S. Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. Uh, the University of Tennessee Institute of Agriculture is a member of the U.S. Roundtable, uh, and uh, through our, our networking and partnership in that, uh, Dr. Bates was able to um, to talk to Golden State Foods and Nestle uh, to work with us and, and uh, support us uh, to present these webinars to you to get the infrastructure together. And um, in the questions that we ask in the, in the survey, uh, we'll actually be uh, trying to prepare uh, to address more uh, educational information toward uh, sustainability and, and doing that by evaluating the U.S. Roundtable's uh, sustainability metrics for the cow-calf uh, sector and then taking that step by step further into delivering, delivering uh, more educational material to you uh, to um, give you the opportunity to be more sustainable as the market drives uh, our cow-calf production that way. Even more so than that, though, the thing I like to always uh, iterate, reiterate is that uh, a lot of what you already do as cow-calf producers is sustainable. It's sustainable by nature because you think about it in uh, the um, terms of environmental sustainability, generational sustainability, and certainly economic uh, sustainability. Uh, so we want to be able to capture that as well, what we already do that is sustainable. So the rest of the non-cattle producing uh, world, our consumers uh, can understand uh, that uh, a lot of what we already do uh, can be um, characterized as sustainable just by the nature of having done it for um, years and years and years and, and plan to, to keep that going in your family for years to come. Um, another thing too that I like to, to say about our work with uh, U.S. Roundtable and partnering with Golden State Foods and Nestle uh, is that to, to provide a voice for you, the cow-calf producer, in uh, the sustainability discussion uh, so that we can, uh, you know, uh, I guess have a, a voice in uh, what sustainability actually means on a lot of different levels and those uh, different uh, categories that, that I mentioned there. So again, just want to always recognize and, and appreciate our partnership uh, with U.S. Roundtable for Sustainable Beef, Golden State Foods, and Nestle in supporting us uh, in, in delivering this uh, webinar series uh, to you. I'll also remind you that as we go through the webinar tonight, uh, it's not a meeting format in Zoom uh, that you might be used to. So if you've been on Zoom where you see a lot of different uh, camera um, images and, and can talk to a lot of different people, that's not what the webinar platform is. So we don't see your video uh, and we don't hear your audio. And uh, you just see myself, Courtney Carter, who's another moderator uh, here this evening. And Dr. Higgins, you'll see um, our videos uh, but uh, we don't see you. So if you'd like to interact with us and ask Dr. Higgins a question, if you'll put that in uh, to the Q&A box, so somewhere on your uh, platform, if you're watching it on the desktop app uh, or in a browser on your phone, you should be able to click the Q&A and that brings up a box that looks like this, depending on you know how you're accessing it. And you'd be able to type in your question. And as Dr. Higgins presents this evening, I'll be um, watching those uh, questions come in and, and I call it curating those, but I'll, I'll be just uh, kind of looking at the trend of the questions. If there are several asking essentially the same thing, uh, then I'll have those ready to ask him at the end uh, so that, that we can get to some answers to your questions uh, by doing that. Now, um, one thing I'll say is in the, the past uh, couple and in the, the uh, fall series, we certainly aren't able to get to every question. Uh, but it's, it's good to go ahead and even if you see a lot of questions in that Q&A box, go ahead and type your question in because, um, you know, it's something that, that uh, we can, if we don't get it addressed this evening, uh, we can follow up or we can um, encourage you to ask your, your local UT Extension A&R agent uh, that question and, and find you some, some answers to that and, and find some of the materials 
that Dr. Higgins has provided, you know, to, to get to those questions, get some answers for that. So again, the Q&A box, we also will have the chat going. Uh, you can use it, but if you have a question about the material, I'd encourage you to put that in the uh, Q&A box. Um, so again, this is something that, that I've been really excited uh, to, to see coming on our, our lineup for uh, the spring webinar series, uh, talking about designs uh, of cattle farming systems and thinking about this as a, a whole systems uh, approach to uh, looking at your facilities and efficiency. Um, so Steve Higgins is on faculty at the University of Kentucky in their biosystems engineering department. Uh, he's also their um, director of environmental compliance. And the way uh, we came, uh, came about to, to see Dr. Higgins materials and, and have him down to talk at our Hereford Development Center and, and several different things is um, uh, Matt Webb, who is our A&R agent and director in Marshall County, where the uh, Tennessee Beef Hereford Development Center is. Uh, got really interested in Dr. Higgins' work and took a, a group of his producers up to Eden Shell Farm in Kentucky that you hear, you'll hear uh, Steve talk about. Uh, took him up there, got really interested in what he saw, and then uh, came back and talked to, to Kevin Thompson, who's the director of the, the research station here in Spring Hill and Lewisburg, where the Heifer Development Center is, uh, and Forbes Walker, who's in our uh, biosystems engineering and soil science uh, department. Uh, kind of work, Matt worked with all those uh, key players to um, install some of the uh, hay feeding systems that, that you'll hear Dr. Higgins talk about tonight, uh, fence line hay feeding systems. Uh, there's quite a bit more to it than, than just that, but uh, it's really been exciting to watch it work and I appreciate Matt for, uh, you know, kind of starting this relationship uh, with Steve and and looking at uh, bringing some of the kind of work he does uh, down to the Hereford Development Center there in Lewisburg. So more of you here uh, in Tennessee can see demonstrations uh, of this uh, this work and, and um, you know, how it, uh, it uh, really relates directly to uh, saving in hay waste, feeding ease, just a lot of different things that, that can make your life easier. And that's really what we uh, want to try to, to bring to you by way of demonstrations like that, the, the translational type research that we do. So. Again, I, I just wanted to, to thank uh, Matt Webb there in Marshall County for uh, getting a lot of this started here in Tennessee. And I uh, very um, much want to thank uh, Steve Higgins for being with us tonight. And uh, in, you know, in just with thinking about time, Steve, I'm going to go ahead and stop talking and stop sharing my screen and just uh, turn it over to you. You're welcome to give any more of an introduction uh, than that if you'd like to. But uh, other than that, I'm going to let you have it. Okay, let's see, I'll get this started. Okay, we got the right screen up? Yes. Okay, all right, so design considerations for cattle farming systems. And yes, I appreciate Matt Webb as well. I, I really do appreciate him and, and Larry Moore coming up to uh, Eden Shale Farm. I uh, appreciated them uh, and it's been a great interaction that we've had, good relationship and I wish to continue it as well. So with that said, before we get started, I, I need to get everybody's mind right, okay? So I got this slide right here. I need everybody to read this. Okay, and I, and I want you to read this. Now I want you to count how many letter Fs are in this, uh, in this sentence. Okay, all right, so some people, most people are going to get three Fs, okay? They're going to count three. Some people are going to get less than that. Some people might have more, all right? The point is, is that there's six of them in this sentence, okay? So I subscribe to this philosophy that 95% of what we see every day is invisible to us, okay? We, we're on our farms every day. It's our farm. We're there every day, and there's a lot of things we just don't see. But with that said, I just want you to kind of get your mind right as far as what I'm going to present. Got an extension agent that uh, had met with a group of producers and they got out a whiteboard and they said, okay, this was in April and they said, what are the issues that they're dealing with as, as far as winter feeding? And the, basically their issues were poor winter feeding areas, hay waste, mud, erosion, access to the property, knee deep mud, loss of body conditioning score on the cows, poor hay, rain, uh, torn up fields, death of the animals, both cows and calves. Calving issues, weak calves, rain, 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 okay? To me, what this is, is basically, this is the environment messing with us, okay? And, and I think the environment is, uh, is something that we, we don't really take 
in consideration very much, okay? But there's environmental factors that, that affect cattle production. And before I get into that, but, and this thing about environment, and a lot of people wanna shut down when they hear this word about environment. But what I think you need to understand is, is 70%, 70% of the productivity of an animal is dictated by the environment. Everything else is 30%. The environment is 70. Let me give you an example. Let's say that you got an, uh, a diet, a ration, and, and that ration will put on two and three quarter pound a day gain which is really great. But if those animals are walking in belly deep mud, then they're not gaining, okay? Let's say that you, uh, you did a really good job of, reprodu of your reducing your reproductive window, your calving window down to say 45 days out of the year. Well, that's really great. And let's say you, you bred them to some great bull, you know, you got you know, streaming stalls off the internet or something like that, and you bred them to this great bull. But if those calves are born and they freeze and stick to the ground, then the, that genetics didn't do you any good. It's the environment that's messing you up. So you got to design around the environment. So the environmental factors that affect cattle production, in my opinion, is the surfaces on which they stand, the space provided for them to move, eat, and drink, the air they breathe, and the means by which they're confined. And all of those factors are basically affected by space and time, which might sound really weird, but you'll come around to it. All right, so the surface on which they stand. I took this photograph. I was on somebody's farm, and I and all these these calves were over here on the left, and this this uh, this white one, the smoke was over here on the right, and it was wanting to get with its buddies, but it waited for like ten minutes to cross this uh, this mud, and once it got over there, it was like, why am I here? And so I, I just like this is drudgery to me. And then you look at that hillside in the back with those contours on there. Here in Kentucky, we got animals that have longer legs on one side of their body than the other. All right, so. When an animal's walking in mud, this is what's gonna happen. If it's walking in four to eight inches worth of mud, its feed intake is gonna go down by eight to eight to 15%. It's gonna go down. Why does it go down? Because it doesn't wanna walk through that mud to get to the trough, okay? But its total feed required goes up by 12% or 13. Why is that? Again, because it is walking in mud, okay? Therefore, your average daily gains are gonna go down by 14% for four to eight inches worth of mud. Well, from an engineering standpoint, let's say that we get rid of that mud. Well, then what's gonna happen? Well, what's gonna happen is, is you're gonna get your average daily gains back, okay? And then you're actually gonna be feeding them actually less, about 12% less. So what's gonna happen is, is they're gonna get 14% gains, you're gonna feed them 12% less, which is around a 26 or 27% increase inefficiency by getting rid of four to eight inches worth of mud. So that's something that you wanna consider. Mud is a just nasty thing because it is sticky, it is slippery. Uh, in this situation, what it does is, is it clogs the hair coat on the animals and then that gets rid of the insulative value of that hair coat. Therefore, those animals have to eat more to you know, create more energy to get warm because their hair coat is messed up. And then when you take an animal like this to the stockyards and you sell it, do you make more money because it weighs more? No, you get docked because of the amount of mud it's on the animal, on the carcass. So mud is something you need to control because it's costing you money. And this right here is the smartest animal on the property, okay? So from an engineering standpoint, you wanna get rid of the mud. So what you wanna do is you wanna look at the foot pressures, all right? So human foot pressures that they provide on the surface is around 14 PSI, 14 pounds per square inch. Cattle are twice as much at around 27, okay? But then look at this, a D9 caterpillar dozer is 16 PSI, okay? A D9 dozer weighs 50 tons, okay? This means that basically cattle provide 166% more pressure to the surface of the soil than a 50 ton bulldozer, okay? But what you have to understand is, is that it's standing, okay? When you look over here at trampling pressure, what happens is, is that PSI jumps up to 48. Why is that? Because the animal is putting, it's going, it's putting that pressure on two feet rather than four feet when it's walking. So it's transferring its load to two feet. So it's getting up to 48 PSI. So what you want to do is, is design a surface that it provides at least that 48 PSI back to that animal. Otherwise it is going to sink. Okay. So now you have types of surfaces. And so you've got, uh, the first one, it says uh, soft clay or sandy loam. Well, have you ever seen that described before? How about silty clay loams, silt loams, clay, sand, silts? It's basically, it's, it's 14 PSI. And what that is describing is, 
is the is basically the texture of topsoil. Okay, topsoil does not have enough bearing capacities to support the weight of those animals, which is why they sink and why you create mud. Okay, so you want to beat 48. So you go down here and you got 55. And that beats 48, but it basically says compacted coarse sand. So let's say you actually get a vacation and you go to the beach. And so you're walking along the beach and, and, and so the surf comes up and it hits your feet and then it recedes back into the ocean. What happens to you? You sink, okay? So when you apply moisture to these surfaces, it reduces the strength that they can support. So that's not gonna do it, but 83 will, okay? Which is basically a compacted gravel mixture, 83. So this is why the NRCS, uh, state conservation groups, uh, any kind of funding agencies will fund heavy traffic paths that are made out of geotextile fabric and rock because they are designed to support the weight of the animal so it doesn't sink. When you get down to concrete at 6,000 PSI, it's indestructible. If you place it correctly, it'll easily last 30 years, okay? It's, it's just indestructible. So there's the deal. I mean, that's basically the engineering properties of, of basically how this pressure is done and how you supply um, surfaces for these animals. Now, the problem is, is this data, okay, of, of these measured uh, pressures coming off of these cattle. This data was actually collected in the 1950s. And in the 1950s, we were raising cattle that were about the size of a St. Bernard. Okay, hang on. All right, there you go. And then this, that's Lyndon Johnson with probably about a three-year-old bull, all right? Now, these are not, you know, miniatures or dwarfs, okay? This is the genetics that we had at the time. Since the 1950s, we have changed the, the genetics of these animals by 30%. Therefore, this is what we can produce and have produced back in the past. Now, this is kind of hard to get through the uh, slaughterhouses because this carcass might even, you know, drag the kill floor. So we kind of had to back off this a little bit. But just imagine the pressures of, of this, this guy right here and its dams of what it could supply to the surface of the soil. Now, there's money involved, okay? So here's basically, there's four different options right here. There's unimproved, there's gravel, there's geotextile fabric, and there's concrete. Let me get this mouse turned on here so we can see this. All right, so let's go to this one. Here's gravel, and then these are relative costs, okay? So basically you're looking at, at 34.25 for a gravel track pad, and here, here's geotextile fabric at 2,400. Well, why is there a thousand dollar difference between the two of these? Well, if you install a gravel pad only for cattle to stand on, in order for it to be support their bearing capacity, what it has to be is as a foot thick rock structure, okay? A foot thick of gravel, which is very, very expensive. Now, if you use geotextile fabric and rock, it is cheaper because the geotextile fabric actually provides reinforcement, separation, drainage, um, friction. And so it's great. If you're, gonna, if you're gonna put in one of these pads, you have to use the geotextile fabric, have to, okay? Now, concrete at 37.50 is a lot of money, but it, it's indestructible, okay? You put it in correctly, it'll last you forever. What is the most expensive cost here of these four is this one, which is what? Doing nothing, okay? That's feeding more, that's wasting more feed, that's animals walking around in, in, in lots of mud, it's lots of drudgery, and, and then it's just losses. You can have losses from mortalities, disease, whatnot. So doing nothing actually costs you more than doing some of these other engineered practices, okay? Here's another way of looking at it. If I have no mud on the farm, I can finish out an animal in 114 days, okay? 62.50 per hundred weight. Again, just relative dollars. Don't get, don't get too tied up on that. But if it's six to eight inches of mud, it's 133 days to finish out that animal. So it's taking me three more weeks to finish out that animal. And that's at a cost of $6,350 because I've lost money because I had to feed it more. There's other costs that could be involved here too because maybe you didn't finish the animal in time and so you lost market opportunities because it took you three more weeks to finish it. But this amount right here of $6,350, I don't know that much about economics, but this is how far my economic theory goes. If this represents the amount of money that you're losing, that represents the amount of money that you should spend on a project to eliminate the mud, okay? Let's talk about this. Okay, so a producer that I know drove through this pasture in the winter time, okay, and created these ruts that you can now see in the in the you know middle of summer, okay. 
And what we call this is, is this is basically, this is permanent failure, okay? And uh, it's permanent for several reasons. One is, is because basically that vehicle making that one pass going through this field, the, you know, the, the soil could not support the bearing capacity or, of that truck. And so basically the soil failed, okay? And it failed and it's permanent damage. You can't even grow grass back in this again, okay? And it's also permanent because I've got too much stuff to do to go back and fix these two ruts, okay? But the thing I want you to think about is, is what is the difference between this permanent failure and this, okay, that we do every year when we winter feed, okay, where we got the animals doing all this pugging and plodding around, but we're also taking tractors out there, which is also rutting up the field as well, okay? Now, it turns out that basically the tractor driving actually tears up the field more than what the cattle do. And what's going on here is, is you can see what's going on on the surface as far as these ruts that it's created, but we also have to think about is what is going on at depth, okay? And so here's this tractor. It's not a really good image, but this tractor is basically made a pass over this soft soil. And they basically are showing this soil profile here to show you how basically it has deformed the soil down to like this depth on this side, but not as far over here on this side. Well, the difference is, is like, again, here down in here and here is what there's a different tire on the back side of this left and right of this tractor. And so what that is, is an example of how technology, good technology in this case, is actually not putting as much bearing load on, on the soil. So what I think you need to do is, instead of creating all this mud and taking these tractors out there and stuff like that and tearing things up, is to basically create what I call control points and controlling the traffic of where you go and how you do things. Now there's a couple options. This is a water that's on our farm. Over here, the photo on the left is showing what it was like before. And so what they would do is, is every year they would come in and they would put in around nine inches of soil around this uh, water. And then every year it would disappear. This photo on the right is basically the same water. But what we did is we did this product called soil cement, where you actually add dried uh, type one bag cement to a tilled soil. And then you till in the cement and then you add water and then it, when it cures, it's almost as hard as concrete. It's, it runs around 3000 PSI. It's, um, it's almost as strong as concrete, but putting this in is a lot of work. Carrying around what, 80 pound bags of cement and spreading that around uh, is a lot of work. And the other thing too is, is you're gonna blow concrete boogers for about three days, okay? This is a heavy traffic pad made out of geotextile fabric and rock. Uh, when this was put in, that's when the photo was taken. Something to notice is, is the water is leaking right here. There's a tree in the background that's alive. Years later, um, the traffic pad is still there. The water is still leaking. And these leaking waters, to, just to make a point, when they leak, then basically what's going to happen is, is that it's going to undermine and weaken that rock. If it was soil, it would be even worse. But geotextile fabric and rock pads are a way to go, particularly if you're, even if you're renting property, all right? The way to put these things in is basically to excavate out the soil. In this case, you're going down about nine inches at the bottom of this pie pan or, you know, brownie pan, if you want to call it, you put down the geotextile fabric. I use an eight ounce fabric, non-woven. Uh, that's, that's my product of choice. You can get it in various uh, lengths and widths. I, I typically deal with the 15 foot uh, pads because that's what I'm doing. And then it's got, you're adding basically six inches of four, number four crushed stone. It could be number twos, threes, or fours. And then you put on the top of it, you put about three inches of dense grade aggregate. There are some producers that'll come on top of this and put about an inch or two of uh, ag lime or class I sand so that when you go to scrape this off, it just comes off cleanly without taking it out of any of the dense grade aggregate. But this distance right here of three inches and six inches or a total of nine inches also depends on where you are. If you're up on a summit position on a hill, on a hill slope or you know, top of a summit position, then yes, you're probably looking at about maybe six, nine inches of topsoil, which is that's what you need to remove. But if you go to a bottom area where all that soil over the years has eroded and been deposited, you might have to dig down three feet before or four feet before you find a, a um, compactable clay layer that you can actually put this geotextile fabric on and build up on. So the point is, is you don't wanna be down in the bottom in soft soils and deep soils to be doing this. You wanna be up on a summit position to do these heavy traffic pads. Again, the idea is, is you're, you're cutting out this, uh, this soil and basically you're making a shelf 
or a you know steep slope or, or a sidewall basically where this uh, the rock and the fabric goes in. And the point of having that that sidewall there is actually to hold the rock in place. Okay, if you go in and put filter fabric on top of grass and put rock on top of that, that rock is going to be scattered to the four winds. Okay, and it's this it's not going to last. You got to cut and get rid of that topsoil because topsoil has no strength to support the weight of cattle. And then you come in and you put your filter fabric in. And basically you wanna layer it in this situation, it's a large pad. So we're basically, you wanna lay this thing down like shingles. You wanna start at the bottom and work your way up to the top because you don't want that water going underneath of that fabric. You also wanna work with a dry soil. If you do this stuff on a wet soil, then it's not gonna, it's gonna fail almost immediately. When we overlap these, uh, these sheets of fabric, we usually overlap them by a foot, foot and a half, and then we're basically using grass pins to, um, to tack them down. But you want this stuff spread out like a sheet and no wrinkles, and because the point of getting rid of those wrinkles is, is to basically provide that reinforcement. The whole point of that filter fabric is, is basically like, if you're walking through mud and you're sinking six inches, well, there you go. But if you lay down like a sheet of plywood over that mud, now you can traverse over it and you're not sinking. And that, that geotextile fabric provides the same thing. It's a reinforcement to spread that load out over a larger area. And then here we're applying the gravel on the edge of the pad. We'll take a bulldozer and we'll push the gravel onto the fabric. If you pull the bulldozer or not, the, if you pull the dump truck on the filter fabric and dump the rock and then drive off, you'll wrinkle it. The tires are spin it and now you got a mess. So the best thing to do is, is put it off on the side and then push it on, okay? And then after you've done this, then you can have a feeding area like this, where basically you can feed, you know, hay through ring feeders on a pad that has plenty of room for basically the animals to access it and be able to stand on the pad while they're eating. Typically, I like to put, in this case, it says 18 feet, but I like to have 20 feet in between these rings. I need eight feet for each animal, and then I need four foot for a pregnant cow to pass behind them. So that's a 20 foot distance in between these rings. So this is something you can do. And then a lot of people do this. And in some situations, we have these um, riparian areas that are down here and those are sensitive areas and we wanna have clean water. So another thing that you can do is rather than fence off the entire creek, which might take all the bob wire that Southern States has, you can put in this little lot right here, which is basically a filter strip, which basically this would be downhill from the feeding area. And so what this does is, is it basically soaps up a lot of that nitrogen and phosphorus. And basically you can use that to basically make the grass grow. And then you can open up this gate and you can allow the animals to eat it. But the idea is, is to have this grass thick and deep and lush to slow down that runoff, to absorb and a lot of those nutrients and also let a lot of that water infiltrate that's coming off that runoff and basically allow it to get into the soil profile, into that root system where you can actually grow some grass. What I do not like to see is, is a, a couple things in this particular photo, all right, and this is on our farm, I hate to say that, but I do not like to see the filter fabric showing. That filter fabric belongs in the bottom of that pit, okay? It does not to be up here on the top. If we go to clean this off and we snag that with the front end loader, we've messed things up. Another thing to point out is, is this rock size is too large, okay? Your final surface basically needs to have some dust in it. It needs to be ag lime, you know, crust fines, you know, whatever, okay? But it needs to have that dust in order to lock in this rock, okay? Once you compact it, particularly if you get it wet, it'll cure and almost be as hard as concrete, okay? But when it's large size rock like this, there's a couple of things that are gonna happen. One is, is it's gonna walk off because it's not locked in. Number two, cattle don't like to walk on this size rock. So if you're actually using this as a pad for feeding animals, well then we've kind of messed up because they don't like to get on this rock. Now, after so many, what, uses of it, it these, these crevices will fart, start to fill in with um, manure and dirt and soil and so on and so forth, but that's, that's not ideal, okay? Shifting gears, forgot to tell you guys that I'm, one, I'm moving a clip, which you've already picked that up, but I'm gonna shift gears a lot through this presentation. And you're just basically just along for the ride, but you're also starting to put these concepts together. So right now we're gonna shift gears over to basically hay storage, okay? So if I bale a roll of hay and make this hay, and then basically I store it outside, what's gonna happen is, is I'm gonna rot the outer six inches of this roll bale and I'm gonna rot the bottom 12 inches where this radius basically attaches to the ground. 
And this on the outside is, is where the meat is, okay? So in doing this, what you're losing is, is 42% loss on the hay bale by baling it and storing it outside, okay? So that's not good. You're, you're, you're starting off with a grade of, of 58. Where I, where I go to school, that's, that's, that's failing. That's, that's not a good grade, okay? So another thing to shift to is, is how and where we feed. Okay, so hang on, let's go back to this. So let's say that I got a five by five bale, okay? So that five by five bale is gonna have a 25 foot square foot surface area that's gonna get rained on. So rain hits that 25 square feet and that's what's gonna rot 42% of the bale. So the point is, is that moisture ruins hay. If you bring it up too wet, it's gonna rot. If you put it in moisture, it's gonna rot. So we know moisture ruins hay, correct? Yes. So if we know that moisture ruins hay, why do we feed in a draw? Okay, this is a draw right here. All right, you can, and all this upland water that's going to run down through this winter feeding area. This guy's down from my house. Okay, so that's probably not a decent example. This one's better. Okay, so you're feeding basically in a draw. So all this water up on this upper area is going to go through this winter feeding area. Okay, and if there is a way to take a bale and stick it on a side of a hill, and basically make it more prone to rotting, it would be to put the cut end up, which is how these are, okay? Here's another one. This is actually on our farm, one of our farms. And so I, I go to this, I go to the farm and I take this photograph where we're basically, we've been doing winter feeding right here. We're starting getting some little, you know, gully erosion going on right here. Well, the issue is, is I'm in engineering. And, and so what this guy's doing is the farm crew is basically coming in from a gate that's way up here that you can't even see and they're driving down here to put this hay down and then they're driving back, which is basically an empty trip, okay? It's just, it's just wasting time, okay? Meanwhile, you can see that the cattle are up here and that is a J bunk up on that summit position, which is where they should be feeding. But instead they're coming down here and they're putting the bales here. So then I come back the next year and it's worse, okay? Gully erosions, more pronounced. We're losing more soil coming down through this way. You can still, you can see the tractor driving marks. You still can't see the gate where they're coming through. And then the following year, I come back and it's even worse. So instead of putting the rings here like they were before, now the ring is right here. You see that? Well, this is a bigger watershed area over here and all this water is running through where they're feeding their animals. And so, I'm the director of animal environmental compliance for the College of Agriculture. And then I get a hold of the farm crew. I'm like, what are you guys doing? What are y'all thinking? And they're like, Steve, before you started working here, we didn't think about any of this stuff. Now that we are thinking about it, we'd like for you to go get a job someplace else. All right. So we're all too familiar with winter feeding. So here's another situation where we've given these animals full access to these roll bales, okay? And so, yes, they're, they're eating some of it, okay? And, uh, and, but they're also, you got, a, you got a calf right here that's knee deep, hock deep in this mud right here. You got a calf right here that's probably getting ready to get stepped on by someone other than its mother. And now you've either got a calf that you've got a doctor or you've got a dead calf, which is a significant loss in my opinion, okay? But also they're gonna urinate on it, they're gonna defecate on it, they're gonna trample it, and they're gonna commingle that hay in with that mud. And so my question to you is, well, wait. And so then this is what it looks like in the spring. Okay, so now you've got this huge waste of hay that was wasted and not eaten, okay, which means you had to go into the field more to feed them because you're wasting more feed. I've got calves standing in these mud puddles, which is not good for them, okay? And then someone's got to clean this up. Now, the whole point in designing roll bales back in the day, in the 60s, was to basically save you labor. But when you have to clean up this kind of stuff, that, that's not a savings to me. But the question I have is, is when you feed like this, how much, how much feed do you actually waste as far as percentages? Take a guess. How much do you waste when you feed like this? Well, anytime I get a question I don't know the answer to, I go to the books. I look at the research and I go, what, what does it say? Well, here's an example. And so what you've got is you've got zero to 100% waste and you've got no feeder right here. So if I'm feeding with no feeder, I've got data points that start off around 36, 37%. They go up to about 97%, which I can take you to our farms and show you that. But you're looking at an average of 58% waste, okay, on average, okay. 
So that hay that you're bringing in, you're wasting 58% if you do not have a feeder. Now, conversely, here's a ring right here. If I'm using a ring feeder, look how tight and close that data is, right around 20%. If you wanna use something else, then you'll see some other data points and you can see the data going down. But the point of this is, is that providing some sort of containment around that hay reduces the waste, okay? Now, this is Eden Shell Farm uh, back in the day before I arrived. This is probably around 2011, 12, something like that. And what we've got going on right here is, is we've, we've been feeding, you know, and, and putting feed in these con or concentrated diets in these portable bunkers, but we have rutted up our side of the, of the fence, okay? What's amazing to me is, is one lane over is the gravel road for the farm. We just made another dirt road next to the gravel road to do this. And we've rutted it up pretty good. And then on the cattle side of the fence, well, look at, look at this elevation difference between the right here and this area right here. We've lost a foot of soil. It's gone, okay? It's not down at the bottom of the hill, all right? It's in the Gulf of Mexico. It is gone. Now, next year, what am I gonna be able to grow here? Cockabers, maybe some crabgrass, a whole bunch of bare areas, you know, that kind of thing. It's, it's, it's not productive. It's, it's just not good. So my idea was to go to this exact same spot and basically do what, what I'm gonna show you, which is basically these fence line feeders. We also call them cubbies. But basically here's your farm road, okay? And you just go in on this existing fence line and you just basically put in a fence line feeder, it says 18 feet, but I like the 20, okay? And so now you've got a situation where you do not have to go into the field to feed. You don't have to drive up to the gate, dismount the tractor, open the gate, drive through, get off the tractor real quick to close the gate so you don't have any you know, escapes. And then you're like, where am I gonna put this roll bale? You know, I've torn up this area over here, but I'm gonna take this roll bale over here so I can work without those cattle getting on their foot. But as soon as you get over there and you're getting the wrap off, they've already shown up. And now you're trying not to put a roll bale on a cow's head, or you're trying not to back over a calf because you can't see them because of the cab and the humidity and whatnot. With this system, you just put the roll bale in the empty slot, okay? There's no reason to go in the field. So we built several versions, okay? This one has a roof, which it may or may not need, depending on how much you feed and how many animals there are, you know, as far as if it's gonna be there for quite some time, a roof might be good, but it might not be necessary if they're gonna clean it up fairly quickly. The cattle are standing on a concrete pad, 10 foot concrete pad that they're standing on. They're eating off of a six inch feed table. So that raises the feed up for them to get it easy to eat. I'm using metal feed panels right here. And so this is the Cadillac model. This one right here is basically it just the same one. It just doesn't have the roof. This is all concrete throughout with a six inch feed table. Don't give me a hard time about that gate. I, I hung it square. It just, this is when the photo was taken. This one's out of wood, okay? I just, again, there's different building materials that you can use to uh, save money on the project, but you're looking at differences also in the lifespan of that project as well. But this is some a treated wood panel that we put together. If you're gonna use something like this, then I highly stress that you put a huge emphasis on the hardware. Because if there's anything I don't like is when I see one of these, uh, these panels, these staves or verticals, laying on the ground with the nails pointing up because I've seen it numerous times. And then, and so hardware is critical, okay? This is another one we did. This one is showing gravel, but what this is, is it's geotextile fabric and rock. And then I use this plastic grid that I like. It's a, a, it's a traffic grid. And then I basically, I fill those holes in and that plastic with, uh, with this rock here. And same thing with this, this is just rock on the inside of this. And then this is, uh, is basically, this is a three section hay feeder. And we basically, we kept two sections bolted up and then we bolted these two things up between two eight foot posts and we're done. So if you buy two of these rings, okay, then basically you can create three of these feeders. And the situation is, is you might not even need the gates on the front side, but here they are all in a line, okay? And all of this area right here where the cattle are standing on is basically what we call an all weather surface, okay? It's a hardened surface for them to stand on and it is designed not to fail, okay? It will fail eventually. You know, in some cases, these filter fabric and rock, and in my experience, they last about five to seven years. But this concrete, again, indestructible. So no matter if it's geotextile fabric and rock or it's rock and gravel or it's concrete, these are all weather surfaces. And you're accessing all of this from the road, which means there's no need to go into the field to feed. 
Looking at it from the other way, by separating these, uh, these feeders by 20 feet, that allows me to put in two 10 foot feed panels right here. I can also use the same area to feed a concentrated diet. So I'm utilizing the same area to do multiple purposes. So this is an advantage if you want it. And then I've got a winter uh, shelter belt or windbreak over here on the other side. Now this is sitting on a summit position. So basically these cows will be up on top of this hill. They're gonna be protected by uh, the wind from these trees. They're gonna eat their fill and then they're gonna leave, okay? This photo was taken in the spring. This is a 12 inch mark right here. This is how much waste I got. And it's in the spring because you can see it germinating. But these cattle took this down to the concrete, okay? Well, that's basically minimal waste right there. When you look at the outside of the structure, again, this was taken in the summer. This is the waste that remained after feeding these roll bales over this particular season. It's negligible, okay? So again, here's some more data, all right? So somebody did a study and it was done on concrete and they did a study evaluating a cone feeder, a ring, a trailer, and a cradle. Uh, all the body weights statistically are the same. All the body conditioning scores are the same. What you wanna look at is right here, percentage of hay waste, okay? So in this situation with the cone, they wasted three and a half percent. With the ring, they wasted 6.1. With a trailer, 11.4. With a cradle, 14.6. All right. Something else I want you to look at is the body, or the, the basically the intake based on a percentage of the body weight. So normally cattle are going to eat 2%. So here you are, 1.8, 1.8, 2%, 1.8. .8. So the point that this makes to me is, is that an animal is going to eat 2% of the weight. Let her have it. Okay but it's the design of the feeder that creates the waste, okay? And I also like to put logistics to this stuff. So let's say that you've got a cow and during a particular winter feeding season, you are gonna feed her three roll bales of hay. Well, instead of feeding her three roll bales of hay with a cone, you have to feed her 3.11 because of the waste, all right? 3.2 with a ring, 3.4 with a cradle, 3.5 with a trailer. But look at this one right here. 7.14 with no feeder. So that means that you're going through it, through the gates and opening gates and doing all that stuff over twice as many times than if you'd have provided some sort of containment for that hay, all right? Containment as far as restricting them to have full access. Now, if you wanna put money on it at $25 a bale, which that would be a deal during a drought, okay? You're looking at $77 here you're looking at $178 here. Well, that's a difference of $100 per cow, okay? Per season, per winter feeding season. Now let's look at this photo right here, all right? So uh, I've got a buddy of mine that took this photo and he sent it to me and, and now I'm sending it to you. Okay, so this is a winter feeding site. Is it winter? No, it's not. Is that a historic site? Yes, it is. Look how thick that is. I mean, he's been feeding in that same spot for a long time, okay? Um, the thing about it is, is let's say that there's 12 cows right there, all right? Well, based on what I just showed you, if I buy a ring feeder, and if there's 12 animals there, then I can save $1,200 in the first year, but I got to buy the ring. Then I can get a ring for 200 bucks, which means I save $1,000 the first year, and $1,200 every year after that, as long as the, the integrity of that ring lasts, okay? Well, let's take it a step further. Why do we need to go into the field? Why don't we just do a fence line feeder? Why don't we provide a heavy traffic pad around that feeder so they don't create a bunch of mud around it either? And so these, these, these practices actually add on to one another, okay? So here's an aerial photo of the, of the fence line feeders, okay, all in a row, all right, from the covered one to the, to the rings right here, right off the road. You can see the brown, which is basically the manure that's on that heavy traffic pad, but I got a green tint on this grass, okay? Now, here's my hoop barns, okay? So, and that's where my hay is stored. So how far do I have to drive to load up these feeders? You basically say, not very far, okay? But the farther this distance becomes, the more dysfunctional th this design is, okay? You with me? You don't want to be driving far, all right? And so another thing about this is, is there's, there's, there is a design flaw with this because right, right there, all right, is a two-hole water, all right? If you have water and feed in the same location, there is no reason for those cattle to leave. Everything they need is right there. 
But what you want to do is, is you want to motivate those cattle to do what you want them to do, but also practice their, their normal motivations. So instead of having that water there, what we did was we had a spring that was right here that fed a, an artifact of a pond, but we developed that spring and I put a water right here in this fence line. So now this water serves two different fields, okay? But now the cattle have to walk over here to get a drink. I am motivating them to move out of that area, which is gonna reduce the amount of cleanup that I'm gonna have to make here in the spring, okay? And then this is just that same image. And then these contour lines is basically the topography of this particular area. So just to show you, I am on a summit position right here. The hoop barns are at the actual pinnacle. You can actually see that circle. They are at the summit, but this is on the ridge. Now compare this to actually feeding down in the bottom, which I see all the time. If I feed down here, then all the rain from this area is gonna drain down from this way and also this way and also above on that upland watershed through my winter feeding area. So the point is, is if soil and water makes mud, if you wanna get away from mud, then get them away from the water, okay? Another point I want to make is, again, about the hardware. So this is one of those fence line feeders with the gates on it. And the way I like to do this is, this is a six by six post. I like to run a drill and all thread bolt through here, right? And insert this all thread bolt. And then I recess the nut. So I, again, animal welfare kind of a thing. But what I'm doing is, is when these animals lean against these panels, they're transferring the load to the post, all right? And that hardware can handle it, all right? If you're using something else, it might not last, it might break away. So, so I want you to think about efficient feeding concepts, okay? I want you to step back and think. In my opinion, feed should be moved as little as possible from the point of production to the cow's mouth, okay? I know some producers that will move a roll bale six times before it is actually fed to an animal. In some cases, that, mo that roll bale might travel across that farm 10 miles before it is fed, okay? But the concept should be, don't move it if you don't have to. If you are gonna move it, move it in bulk. If you're gonna feed it, it should be self-fed. You shouldn't have to do as much work as you do. Let them feed themselves. They do it e the rest of the time of the year by grazing. They can do this if you, if you do the engineering behind it. So. And then feed should be consumed with as little waste as possible. Again, you don't want to waste uh, the hay that you bring in by storing it outside, and you don't want to waste it by letting them have full access to it where they urinate, defecate on it, and trample it into the mud, okay? An ideal hay feeder should be suitable with any type of hay package. And a hay package means as we have changed over the years, I mean, I've I brought up a lot of small squares in my day, but we've moved from small, small squares. Actually, they made those um, haystacks back in the day, but haystacks, small squares, then they went to the, the round bale feeders or the round bales, then they went to the large squares and it just continues to go. But a feeder should be able to accept any size hay package, all right? It should allow for flexible limit feeding should not require filling with hay more than once a week because we have a lot of producers that are, um, they work full-time jobs. Their opportunity to feed is on the weekends. So you should be able to feed on the weekends and that's it. You should also be able to reduce the amount of time that you're feeding from the standpoint of as we get older and less mobile, that basically we, we make these things easier for us to feed and still raise cattle. Snow and mud should not interfere with feeding. And the structure should pay with itself within hay and time savings in less than five years. We have data out there, proven data, that if you build a structure for storing your hay in, you can pay for it in three to five years. I would take that one step further and make that hay structure your actual feeder, and then it just provides these additional benefits. And then should be convenient to use and not require the producer to enter the lot, the field, or the pasture. There is no reason for you to get in with the cattle. Or there really isn't, all right? So this one here, this is food for thought, okay? All right, here we go. Look at this image right here. Look at those buildings back in the background first. Tell me how old this image is. Someone say really, really old. Yes, really, really old, okay? What I love about this image is down here, this caption right here, it says right here, it says how not to do it, okay? How not to do it is to basically enter the gate and enter into this confined area, this loblolly, okay, to put any kind of hay or diets in these, in these mangers or bins, okay? 
It is not necessary, all right? So this, just to kind of rub this in a little bit, this is the, um, this is the cover of the Beef Housing and Equipment Handbook. Uh, I guess this is Midwest Plan Service 8, maybe, or something like that. The Midwest Plan Service published this book, uh, and, the, and the authors were probably about, I don't know, 12 uh, to 16 to 20 engineers, agricultural engineers, that specialized on beef housing and equipment hand, uh, handling, okay? So you open this book up, and you go to these two pages right here. So here's hay storage, and then it goes into hay feeding, and then it'll go over here, and it goes over to silage storage. But here's these images, okay? See these images? Just to make this easier, here's all these images from those two pages, okay? And so what's just interesting over here is, is again, I mean, this is how we used to have hay and we had these mangers right here back in the day where basically our storage structure was also our feeder back in the day, okay? But also look at this, this is fence line feeding. This is a cubby or a fence line feeder, fence line feeder, fence line feeder. This right here is basically, you could look at it two ways. That's bale grazing, but that's also a fence line feeder, okay? It's a certain type of bale grazing. It's not the normal one that some people produce or promote. But here's another, again, you're doing fence line feeding in these situations, okay? This, this book was published in the 80s for the fourth time. I mean, this, 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 this concept here is about as old as it can get, okay, of fence line feeding. So here's the deal with ring feeders, in my opinion. They can be an asset or a liability, okay? They're an asset because they're portable and they're cheap, which allows you to feed anywhere you want, all right? But the, the other part about it is, is I think they're also a liability. They're a liability because they are portable and they are cheap. Why do we base your operation off of using something portable when the feeding site has been or will be there for generations? Why don't you build something fixed and permanent, which will allow you to feed without getting in with the cattle, but also reduce the drudgery that's on the cattle as well to get their 2% of their feed, okay? Shifting gears again. This is what I call the Bo Renfro structure. Uh, this is available in Kentucky through uh, State Cost Share. It is a 36 by 50 foot long concrete structure, okay? You're looking at, this is my thing right here. This right here is about a 30 foot long feed manger, which is elevated off of this concrete floor where the cow stands by six inches. So again, you got a raised feed table, you got your, your head gates or, you know, that they can stick their head through and they can eat. Ideally, this will hold about five roll bales of feed. It is designed for about 30 cows, okay? Uh, and, and ideally what this will allow you to do is feed about every five to seven days, okay? What you wanna do is, is you wanna use this type of structure in conjunction with rotational grazing, okay? And, and, a, and a great stocking density as well. You don't wanna overcrowd things, all right? And so what happened was, was uh, there was a grant available for, that came through and basically I had some friends of mine that we worked on this project where we basically built these structures, okay? We built these on people's farms, okay? Several farms. And afterwards, after building them, we said, okay, tell me, tell me what you liked about this structure. What, I mean, just tell me what you liked, what you didn't like, whatever. And so this is what they said. They said it saves hay because it's elevated. You know, it gets those roll bales on that six inch feed table, which elevates it out of the muck and the mire of where the cattle stand, okay? It provides that restricted uh, access to the hay. So you basically, you're saving hay but you're also saving fuel, labor, and pastures because the animals are coming up to the structure. You're not going to them. They are coming to you, okay? You get better manure utilization because you have to clean it off and it's concrete, so it's easy to clean off the manure, which means you can get increased hay production from the manure utilization and, and also get pasture relief, all right? And then there's this last thing of better water quality management, which is good, okay? So, so there you go, all right? So just as an example, this is one of the cooperating farms that received one of these structures. And it, it's basically, it's right here. And I blew this out just to basically show you, here's where his hay fields are. So manure is produced here, it needs to get hauled over here, okay? So let's zoom in a little bit. So this is the operation. So this is the centralized operation and that little white square rectangle right there is the feeding structure, okay? Do you see this lane right here? You see that? Okay. Let me make it a little clearer for you. All right. So here it is. I've isolated basically his pastures and this structure. All right. 
So a question to you is, is how many pastors does that structure have access to? All of them, all six of them, because it has this lane right here that connects them all, okay? Now, let's go on the ground. So there's the structure. This photo was taken in the summer. He's got some residual hay that didn't get cleaned up because, you know, the grass turned on and he moved them out. But here's where his hay is stored, okay? So again, how far does he have to drive to fill up this rack? Somebody say not very far. Exactly, okay? Here's his manure spreader. Again, concrete, scrape this up, haul it away, it's done, okay? Now you look at the photo from the row bales looking back, okay? So again, you can see this. So what he's got right here is he's got a utility barn that he's using as a, a handling facility. This is something I want to point out right here. This is where the water is located, okay? You do not want water located right here, all right? Again, if they're food and water located in the same spot, there's no reason for them to leave. So water needs to be at least 150 feet away from this structure. You don't want them taking a mouthful of feed and dropping it in the water and then fouling that water, okay? <clears throat> so here it is actually being used, all right? So I believe there's about 29 cows in there going to town on this hay, all right? Does anybody see any calves? No. If there was a calf in here, it would probably be laying right in here in this spilled hay, perfect place for it to get stomped and trampled, correct? Yes, okay? So this guy right here, basically, that's, this is the producer. He basically says, okay, girls, leave, okay? And so they leave and they go down the hill to go out to one of these pastures. Well, here right here is the calves, okay? Where were they? All right, I'll show you. Going to the, to the left, there's the, there's the other part of the lane, okay? And so after... After kicking out these 29, he brought down another 34 from this area to have access to that structure. And then right here is your calves. So the calves basically go through a creep gate and they get in here and they hang out with their buddies, which are basically the same size. They got their own hay in here. So this means they are not underneath, you know, or in with the cows and getting stomped and trampled and in the way. All right. So this is a pretty good system of providing a creep area for them to go into. And then he's got this utility shed right here. So he's got his handling chute. He's got a salamander heater. He's got a concrete floor. He's got a lawn chair. He's got a refrigerator over there that maybe has, you know, his live vaccine in it, maybe some beer, that kind of thing. All right. And so when you, you know, they, so that, that's a great situation to have in my opinion. Okay. Zooming in and again, just identifying these things. Okay. So here's his handling area. It's got a chute coming off of this area. So he can basically pull the cattle in here and then run them through the chute. All right, he's got his creep area for his calves. Here's his hay storage right here. He's got equipment shed right here. So everything is, is all contained. And with this lane, it creates this hub of activity, okay? And, it, and it's all well planned out, okay? This is, uh, is one of our farms, okay? And so we've got this elaborate, concrete, expensive, galvanized steel, galvanized post system, and they're feeding hay, in, you know, using a trailer, you know, to these cows. And I'm looking at it and I'm like, guys, how come you didn't fill in these voids with some more hay, you know? And they were like, well, the cows are too fat. So, so we're limit feeding them. And I'm like, I mean, that doesn't make any sense to me. I'm like, why don't you just kick them out and close the gate? And they're like, we can't because this is where the water is located. Okay bad design. I mean, you got, you could put in silage down in here, so they're going to eat this, and they can just go over there, and they can drop all that food down in that water, okay? And let me ask you, does, do you, how often do you clean out of water? Yeah, that's my point. Okay, so anyway, this is one of those bad designs, all right? So the take-home point from this is, this part of it is, is the far-reaching and hidden effects of farm layout are not obvious to the average producer, but are no less important Many would be surprised to learn the amount of savings that could be realized from an effective layout. The producer that is impressed by only the things that they can see or feel often overlooks improper layout and fails to recognize it as a major cause of high costs. Well, what do I mean by something that you can see or feel? Well, in my opinion, we love our tractors. I mean, whatever color you want to get into, we love our tractors. We love driving them. It's like a form of therapy, okay? But there is a point where you are just driving way too much. And I think a lot of people get in love with these tractors is because they vibrate, you can drive it, it moves, it, 
you know, it, it, it makes noise, that kind of thing. But you got to realize that the operation that you're designing for is a group of cows that walk. Okay. That's what they're doing. Meanwhile, you're driving. Okay. So you need to think about how to lay out a system that makes it efficient, not only for you, but also makes it efficient for the cattle. Okay. And then when you do these, uh, these structures, like what I'm talking about feeding, you need to have a storage structure for this manure. Okay. It needs to go in something. This is a hoop barn that we have where we basically stockpile all kinds of bad feed, manure and bedding and wasted feed and all that other kind of stuff. And then basically we let it sit in here. We use this basically as a transfer station and then we land apply it and we grow a crop with this stuff, okay? And so now I got a video for you. Let me get out of this, let's see. Turn off this uh, laser pointer. All right, here you go. So what we do in the winter when we're feeding, uh, there's about 40 cows on this feed pad. So every two weeks you have to clean off the manure. We push it back to the covered portion of the feed pad. And there it composts and it dries out. We leave it there all winter. Usually we can get through an entire winter with, uh, with the space that we have in the back to keep pushing back. And then in the springtime, we, when the pastures are dry enough, we take and select certain pastures we feel need more nutrients, we take a manure spreader and we spread those out. And it's a pretty good benefit because it saves you some fertilized dollars. And we think the or organic matter and do you get from the uh, manure and the hay, once it's composted, adds value you know, to your soil. It really builds your soil. So this video right here is really good because basically what he's done is, is he's outlined a lot of, of what I'm describing in this talk. So he's feeding on concrete, which is the hardest surface that you can get, okay? He's designed a structure that has enough space or capacity to handle the, the manure and the bedding and the wasted feed that he's going to be putting in it. And then he let it sit there and, and drain, okay, and dry out, which means it is cheaper for him to haul and easier for him to haul a dry manure than something that is basically Kyle Plop's consistency. He also waits to apply it after the fields have basically drained. He's using a soil sample, okay, to figure out where that manure should go to take advantage of the nutrients that, that's in that manure, but he also wants to take advantage of the organic matter. And this is one of those things that gets me is that we turn in soil samples all the time to get them analyzed for fertility, but we don't get those samples analyzed for organic matter. Let me tell you, you ask any soil scientist, okay? The, the fertility or not, the, the, the productivity of a soil is dictated more by the percentage of the organic matter that is in that soil than it is the fertility of that soil, all right? Case in the point. So soil organic matter increases water holding capacity, which is what you want. It enhances water infiltration because you want that water to go through the soil profile so you can grow some grass, okay? It improves the soil structure. It increases the CEC, which again is the ability to hang on to fertility, okay? It enhances microorganisms. It, it buffers the pH. It enhances chelation. It enhances the absorption capacity. It reduces damage by soil pathogens because you're using good bacteria to get rid of diseases in the field and it reduces the ability to compact the soil, okay? Organic matter, in my opinion, is where it is at, all right? If you don't know what your level is, then you can't know how to improve it or, or if it needs to be improved. It, you have to collect data in order to make changes with management. All right, we're shifting gears. The space provided to move, eat, and drink, okay? Okay, here's a question for you. What do you produce? What is your output? Don't say beef, okay? Because you don't produce beef, all right? The calf is the beef. The mama is producing the calf, okay? So she's doing all the work, okay? Your output, in my opinion, what you should be producing is grass, okay? So here's a video that I love to show, all right? This is orchard grass, and basically you're comparing and contrasting continuous grazing versus rotational grazing. So continuous grazing is going to take something down to an inch. Rotational grazing is going to take something down to three and a half. This is time-lapse photography over a five-day period of, of time, okay? That's five days. I love this video, okay? 
So in my opinion, you want this over here on the right. This is why we tell you all and try to promote so much rotational grazing. From an engineering standpoint, this is what I want. I want efficiency. I want, I want crop science 101. I want a full canopy of this grass across the entire field. I don't want any denuded areas, any mud puddles, any bare spots. And the other thing I want is, is when a, when a cow takes a bite, I want her to have a mouthful, okay? Over here, you got a cow that has to take multiple bites to get a mouthful and she's walking around to do it. So in some situations, you are walking pounds off of an animal, okay? By this type of management system, all right? So let's get down to the space, okay? Let's say that I move down to Tennessee and I buy a 200 acre farm. How many cows can I put on it? What is the stocking density that you all kind of shoot for as far as how many cows per unit area, okay? So while you're thinking about that, I'll show you this, all right? I got this, I stole this off the NRCS and basically this is a grazing calculator. And so they go onto this guy's farm or this producer's farm and he's got 86 acres, all right? They have 86 acres, okay? But they have 55 cows, okay? Now, if you were thinking that I wanna have two acres per cow within at 55, you would need 110 acres of pasture. And, and, and if it's two and a half, well, then you just do the math. It's more than what this guy's doing. He has two pastures, okay? <laughs> Spring and winter or the rest of the year and winter or something. So which means he has a grazing efficiency of 20%, okay? And then also, I mean, he's got his cows. I mean, they weigh 1300 pounds a piece. There's a lot of data on here, okay? So what's going on is, is he has to purchase 233 tons of hay, all right, at a cost of $11,653 to feed all these animals because he doesn't have enough grass because he is overcrowded, he is overstocked, okay? So then the NRCS comes along and says, okay, we're going to take your two fields and we're going to put in cross fencing and we're going to make those two fields into five. And by making five fields, now your grazing efficiency has gone up to 55%, okay? But he had to reduce the number of animals that he had down to, down to 30, okay? So he had to reduce them by 25. But now he's only buying 90, 19 tons of hay, all right, at a cost of $965, which is a savings of $10,688, okay? Here's another example. There's a, a research study that was done in Fort, uh, Fort Hayes, Kansas. They get 23 inches of rain per year. They did a nine year study using 650 pound cattle. They grazed at two acres, 3.36 and 5.12 acres per head, okay? Uh, over the nine years, here's your gains, 130, 185, 207 respectively. But what happened to the pastures? In the ninth season, the cattle in the heavily grazed pasture, the two acres per head had to be removed after 124 days because there was no grass, okay? The conclusion was light grazing was wasteful and that heavy grazing could be discouraged and that the highest economy returns in the long run come from moderate grazing. This is what I've learned over the years, okay? And, and, and I have older producers that tell me this all the time. They like to reduce their stocking density, which means they get to graze longer throughout the year, which means their winter feeding is shorter and they get to haul less feed, okay? I have a lot of producers that think that they aren't making enough money. And so what they wanna do is, is they wanna increase their herd size but your output is grass. If you increase your herd size, you are gonna destroy your soils and your grass, and you're gonna end up having to buy a lot of hay or some other things are gonna happen, okay? I stole this data off of Les Anderson, okay? It's kind of complicated, but I'm gonna walk you through it. So right here on this blue line, when Les got to this farm, he was dealing with a cow size that was around 1,750 pounds a piece, okay? They were producing calves. Here's your calf graph right here. Over here on the side is where the, the data is, but it's around 550 pounds is what they were producing on the calf. In this situation right here, they were producing 500 pound calves. But less through AI and genetic selection, lowered the weight of these cows around to about 1375. And by doing that, they increased the weaning weight of these cows up to around what? 650. So a smaller cow is producing a larger calf. Well, why is that? Because a larger cow eats more grass, more groceries, okay? And when she's eating all the groceries, there's nothing to transfer to that calf. After a, cow's, a calf is about what, 90 days old, it's eating 1% of its body weight in forage. So if she's eating it all, there's nothing to transfer to the calf, okay? So your output is grass, okay? So, all right. 
let's go back to space, all right? So if when I design a system like this, how much space do you allow, linear feet of space, do you allow for each cow, okay? In my opinion, it's two feet, just as a rule of thumb. If you get into you know, bigger cows, it could be 27 inches, it could be 30 inches. If you wanna have the calves in here with them, then it needs to probably be a little bit larger for the calves to get to it. But then you could be getting into problems there. But the point is that I want you to think about is, is every linear foot, I mean, there's, I need two linear feet for every cow. So if I've got a 30 foot long manger, then basically I can, I need about, I can have about 30 calves because there's two feet. There's, 30 foot long on each side, plus a little bit on the back, I might be able to get 30, 34 cows in here, okay? Two feet a piece, okay? All right, I got concentrated diets right here. How much space does each one of those critters need at the trough? Again, it's two feet, okay? So if I got 40 critters, then I need 40 feet of bunker space because they're eating off of both sides. Another thing to point out is, is they'll consume that diet in less than 20 minutes, okay? Something else to point out, okay? So think with me here. If I got 40 cows, okay, how much space does each one of them have at this water? Ooh, that doesn't really work out that well, does it? How many holes is that water? I hope you said two, okay? How many can they reach? You should say one, okay? Now, what is the, uh, the drinking water requirement for a cow for a day. How many gallons does she drink in a day? 12 gallons, 15, or is it 95 degrees outside and she's gonna drink 30 or 40, okay? So this varies by time and space. What time of the year is it? Is she getting dew off the grass and her requirement is not that much? So let's say it's, um, let's say it's 20 gallons, okay? How much water does that water hold, okay? Not 20, it's about 20 gallons, but how much of it can she reach? Well, it really doesn't matter. What matters is, is what is the replenishment rate of the supply line going to that water? How fast is that water being recharged? And in order for you to know how fast that, or how, how equal that is, is you would have to know what is the drinking water rate of, uh, of a cow? How fast can she drink water in like gallons per minute? You ever thought about that? Now, before you think about that, have you ever seen a cow swallow a hedge apple? I mean, they've got a throat on them. I mean, they can put away some water, okay? So the research will basically tell you that she can put away about five gallons a minute, okay? Well, this water right here is, is, is uh, poorly designed for a number of reasons, so I ripped it out. And after we ripped it out, I was like, okay, let's turn the water on and see what kind of water rate we have. And this was out of the bare line. This is not going through a float. This is just coming out of the actual supply line. It was coming out at 3.75 gallons per minute, okay? If she drinks five per minute and there's a line of them, then that this, uh, this dog won't hunt, as they say, okay? It cannot keep up with her capacity, okay? Let's look at something else, all right? I got a video for you. And I've sped this video up to twice its speed, just not take up a lot of time. But here's a cow drinking, head button, get away, beat it, get lost, all right? I want you to look, what is the angle of the head of the cow that is drinking? It's straight up and down. It's a 90 degree angle, is it not? All right, so there she's drinking. We could time this. Okay, now here comes your next customer. All right, headbutt again, get away, you're bothering me. Okay, here comes this other cow, all right? Because they come, this is a, all right? Here's another headbutt. There's an, oh, oh, I didn't recognize you. Yes, yeah, sure, have a sip, okay? All right, so I filmed this for 15 minutes and that second animal did not get a drink in that 15 minute time, okay? But as more animals start arriving, you can see where this is gonna be a problem, okay? So I pulled this off the internet for some water, okay? And down here on the bottom, it says capacity, bottom left, it says 150 head. How do you figure? I don't know how they figure this, okay? Because this is what I see. What you need to be doing is, is you need to be watering 10% of your herd at one time, okay? And all of the animals in that herd, in my opinion, should be able to get their drink within a 20 minute period of time, okay? Which is the same amount of time that it would take them to eat that concentrated diet that you would feed them out of those portable bunks where they're just going at it, okay? This is water, okay? 
So if water is considered a limited resource, if they are fighting over it, okay, then they will fight to control it. The more dominant will monopolize the water to get their fill and may guard it and afterwards, the weaker will get pushed aside. For every submissive animal that is turned away, there is a 10% reduction in productivity. The take home point is if cattle are waiting in line, then they aren't eating, they're not gaining, or they're not producing milk, okay? The rules are, is that you should apply an adequate supply. It's a fundamental requirement, okay, of providing clean, abundant water. We have what is called the 800 foot rule, which means cattle should not have to walk more than 800 foot to get a drink, okay? If cattle come up to water as a group, uh, well, I mean, they're gregarious animals, they're herd animals. They are gonna come up one at a time in a line to get a drink. Therefore, you should be able to water five to 15% of the group at, one, at the same time. The supply rate must equal the combined drinking capacity of the animals that can drink at once, or you have to have a storage tank to store that amount of water that which you will replenish after they leave, okay? What is the drinking water rate of a cow? We talked about that in gallons per minute. It's around five, all right? It can get up to six. The herd should be able to drink their water in 15 to 20 minutes. What should the height of the water be? That's an engineering kind of thing because when I'm, when I'm doing a design, I, I can put a water at any level you want, but it's what level do the cattle want to drink water at? So I don't know what you all think. What, what level do you think cattle want to drink water at? How high off the ground do they want to drink water? Truth of the matter is, is they're lazy. They really don't want to lower their head to get a drink, okay? Studies show that they actually like to drink water at 36 inches. But if you have a water at 36 inches, then the calves can't get to it. It shouldn't be more than say 20, 22 inches off the ground if you want calves to get a drink out of it, okay? So 36 inches is their optimum height, okay? So what's the elevation difference between a cow and say a pond? Does she have to like lean over? You know, isn't she like going downhill? Or does it depend on how far they get out in the pond, right? So here's your example right here with this big boy right here. There's your 36 inches. There's your height that he likes to drink water at, okay? Another thing to notice is, is look at the slope on his head, all right? There's forehead. What is the slope there? It's around 55 to 65 degrees. If you take his head and you rotate it to 90 degrees, like that cow in the video I showed you, then basically his nostrils are underwater, okay? Cows don't like to suck water up through their nose. Same as you don't either, okay? All right, so which this 800 foot rule, you wanna keep water within 800 feet and conveniently located. Well, here's three examples of how to lay out a field. Okay, you got a square field. If you put the water in the center with this cross and fencing, then basically cattle have to walk 660 feet to get to this water. If you put it on the end of the field with these two waters right here, which is an additional expense, they have to, watch, or have to walk 1,320. If you put it at the point right here, it's 1,476. And then you're going to put a tremendous amount of pressure on these, uh, these wagon spoke wheels right here on these points. All right. So again, that's a 40 acre pasture showing you different places to put a water, but again, conveniently located, abundant and clean. This is a four way water. I got one of these up at Eden Shale. All right. And so what I've got is, is I got a water that serves four different pastures. I can let all the animals have it by opening up these interior fences, or I can close it off and have a half a group over here or a group over here, okay? Um, let's, let's just kind of take an aside right here. Installing gates on a farm, all right? There's rules on installing gates on a farm. First rule of putting a gate in a farm is, is do not put in one more gate on a farm than what is necessary because they're expensive to install and to maintain. The second rule of gates is, is to install them as close together as possible. That might not make a lot of sense, but it's going to right now. So I can have animals in any one of these fields. Let's say it's this one right here. I can have cattle in this field right here, and I can move them to any one of three other options, and they only have to travel a distance of 45 feet, okay, because the gates are mounted close together. And you don't even really have to move them. All you have to do, if they're over here, you just have to open up this gate. When they come up to get a drink, they're also going to leave. Um, if you're using insecticide ropes, you can put an insecticide rope across this gateway and, and they can have some additional fly control as they come in here to get a drink. There's plenty in here, room in here for putting the mineral. You can put in some portable bunkers. It's a hardened area with concrete, geotextile fabric, and rock. 
cattle like to actually hang out in here when it's uh, wet and nasty and muddy outside because they're standing on firm footing in this particular area. Again, this is not a new concept. This is a 1960s photo. It was published in 1960s, it's older than that. Here's a trough type water. Animal, plenty of animals can drink at one time. You've got a storage capacity for the water right here in the storage tank. You've got storage capacity right here. You got a windmill pumping the water. This water actually serves three different pastures, okay? This one right here, taken out of a really old photo, okay? Look at these fences in the back. That's split rail fences, okay? This, uh, this water, big, huge bowl, got capacity in it. Here's the scaffolding of a windmill. Plenty of animals can drink. I wasn't able to determine how many pastures that this, uh, that this water served. And, um, but here's the deal. This was actually published in 1919, okay? And there's eight feet or so, of, or six feet or so of animal space right here for them to stand on. So they're standing on, on firm, nice footing level for them to get a drink, okay? So that's a 1919 model. Would you like to see a 2019 model? This is a 2019 model, okay? This belongs to a PhD that I know, all right? Every year he fills in this depression, every year it comes back, okay? And he's, he's just wasting time because this was installed improperly. When you compact this soil, when you erode this soil, what you've done is, is you've closed the distance to the supply line and made it more prone to freezing. And, and what, how many, how many pastures does this serve? Just the one it's in, that's it, okay? From an engineering standpoint, here you go. That animal's head likes to be at a 55 to 65 degree angle, all right? Not 90, okay? She's gonna, she or he's gonna stick her muzzle an inch and a half in the water. You only need three to eight inches, but if that water supply can't keep up, then you need to have that additional capacity. But typically, an inch and a half is as far as she's gonna go. Um, and then again, here's, you can calculate the height. Uh, the adults look at 20 to 20, or 24 to 36 inches. Calves is around 20, all right? Science, all right? I got another video for you. What we try to do is the larger pastures to divide them into paddocks of 10 to 15 acres with water within 800 feet of the cattle. That's not always possible because of the irregular size of the pastures or where your shade and different things are, but we feel like it really helps the cattle to have a water source. And we also like the uh, automatic waters. It gets cattle out of ponds. It helps prevent diseases and other foot problems due to standing in water and uh, things like that. Um, the cattle really respond well to when you move them from one pasture to another, it gets your cattle more uh, tame and easier to work with because they always wanna go on the green grass. They like to follow you around. It also allows more regrowth of your pastures and better stand in the long run. What Cannot tell me that a cow standing in a pool of water defecating, urinating, and then turning right around on the downstream side of it and drinking it back in is good for it. Uh, and when you get 20 or 30 cows in one little pool, it really gets pretty nasty. Uh, the, and my herd health, as soon as I pulled them out, out of the creek, started fencing off the streams, keep my cows out of those streams, uh, my herd health was just, uh, unbelievably better. <laughs> uh, I'm going to skip that one. Okay, the air they breathe, all right? So th this is what affects uh, cattle production as far as the air they breathe. It's temperature, humidity, atmospheric pressure, which we don't have to deal with, but if you were out in the, um, the Great Plains, uh, basically with those higher elevations, they get, you know, brisket disease and stuff. The composition of the air, is there any dust in it, any gases in it? Uh, there's also light and radiation and wind. Uh, as far as critical temperatures, as far as temperature, if an animal gets wet, its lower critical temperature is 59 degrees. It rains a lot in the wintertime in Tennessee, so cattle get cold, okay? If they're not wet, they can basically go down to 18, but they're going to be wet, which is mean they're going to they're be very, very cold, which is another reason why they could use some shelter. This is the temperature humidity index. Basically, you want to stay away from some of these orange areas. So like if you're working up cattle when it's 84 degrees and it is 75% humidity, you are putting those animals under some stress. So it's just something to keep it and interested in is basically it's temperature and humidity that affects the stress of these animals. Here are some calves that we just weaned that are underneath some shade cloths. 
uh, it was an 89 degree day uh, when we were separated these calves from their moms. And so we got them on this dry lot that we call a dry lot, which is actually giving me a mud lot when it rains. But I got this infrared temperature gun and I shot the shade underneath of this, uh, underneath the shade cloth and I shot it and it was actually 89 degrees, the same as the air temperature. But if I shot the gravel on the outside, it came out to be 117 degrees, okay? What does that mean? Well, engineers have got this scale that basically if you measure the temperature of the soil or the surface that they're standing on, you can actually create a lot of stress if they're in some heat and they have no relief from it. That's all I'm gonna say about air, all right? The means by which they're confined, okay? Again, I mentioned some stuff about farm layout and the farm layout is the relation of the fields, the gates, the lanes, the waters, the roads, et cetera, to the buildings and to the buildings to each other. A desirable layout is necessary in order to economize labor and enhance the value of the property. This right here is a diagram. This is the layout of a farm where this guy is actually feeding. And that red line represents his actual path of feeding. As crazy as it looks, you haven't seen the crazy part. The crazy part is right here in the center where it says repeat eight times, okay? Then someone like me comes along and says, hey, I'm going to take your existing layout and I'm going to change it for you to make your life better, okay? And what he's done is, is basically, again, he's created a fence line feeder. It says hardcore, which means this is a hardened surface, geotextile fabric and rock, concrete, whatever, okay? But now you can see the path that they are making, which is a reduced path. It's the same farm, it's just a different way of laying it out, okay? Now, what is your job on a farm? With that said, what do you, what is your job? What are you supposed to do, okay? Again, you're not producing beef, okay? In my opinion, you are moving materials. That's what you do. You move feed, you move minerals, you go and get concentrated diets, you move animals. And really theoretically, I mean, you should be moving water, you should be moving this air because ventilation in a confined building is huge, okay? And so a, a given year, okay, a cow in a given year will go through 62 tons of air, 30 tons of water, 23 tons of manure. So if she's in confinement, you need to move that manure, which a lot of people don't like to do, okay? She's gonna graze 20 tons of forages, okay? And then you're gonna come in and feed two tons of hay to her and about a half a ton of grain to her and her calf, okay? What's amazing to me is, is when we get around the time to feed this two tons of hay compared to this 20 tons of forage, this is when we tear our farms to pieces to feed two tons of hay, okay? So your job is to move materials, all right? So farm infrastructure is often given too little or no consideration, which usually results in arrangement that is neither simplistic nor systematic for labor efficiency or livestock production, okay? Many people look at the components of beef cattle production. I got feeding areas. I need, maybe need some housing. I got to water them. I need storage for commodities for my equipment. I need to have good sanitation or do nutrient management. I need livestock handling facilities. I need shelter, okay? And many people look at these as separate components. What I like to do is assemble concepts, okay? And, and have this, basically this mixed use site, which is basically a hub. So I showed you this earlier, okay, of this farm, okay? And now I'm gonna rotate it 90 degrees to show you that there's basically three fields up here. And there's three fields right here with a winter feeding area in the center and a lane that connects them all, okay? This is that design, okay? Same design, it's just, just different way of looking at the squares, okay? And if I put in a water, these blue dots right here, I have two waters that basically serve approximately a 90 acre farm. Two waters, one at the end of each one of these lanes and each one of these waters serves four fields. This water serves four fields, okay? This design was actually published in 1910, okay? It was actually written about in paragraph form in the 1860s, okay? And it utilizes this lane, and lanes are great because it provides direct access with short lanes. Lanes are, uh, long lanes are unproductive uh, use of land and may require additional expense for fencing, filter fabric, rock, et cetera. But easy access to the farm set also simplifies the problem of providing water for the stock. So let's go back to this. If I've got animals in this field, I can move them back to this winter feeding area without going through a second field. 
I can move them from this field to any one of the other five fields without going through a third field, okay? And the distance, any distance from these corners is the same to the centralized location, all right? So, and this is an example of putting a water in a lane, and this is electric fence, 15 acre pastures, one water serving four fields off of lane, heavy traffic pad already there, utilizing the same surface. This is what it looks like on the ground, okay? You can still drive by it. They can graze these other pastures. You can actually let them graze the lane as well since the water is located there, all right? This is the Eden Shale Farm, okay? This is what it was like when I arrived, okay? I got a concrete pad. Looks like they were doing some feeding on it because there's a little bit of manure on it. I got downspouts right here, discharging water on this concrete. Here's another one right here, okay? This is again, the rain coming off this roof, discharging on this concrete pad. Where is that going? Well, it's going off the concrete and it's hitting this piece of grass. But I actually created one of these vegetative filter strips down from this to again, absorb the nutrient content off this concrete, this impervious surface, so I can get some growth off of that nutrients that's coming off that. The roof was already guttered, okay? So what I did was, was I ran the gutters or the downspouts through the barn to the other side. This is the other side. Would it be okay to discharge this water right here in this lawn? Yeah, it would be, probably be pretty good, all right? And so we actually ran that out. It's going into a five gallon bucket right here, but I'm not done, okay? I'm actually collecting the water off this roof and I'm putting it into four 3,000 gallon tanks, okay? So I'm capturing 12,000 gallons worth of water, okay? Why am I collecting 12,000 gallons worth of water? Because I have a herd size of 40. I figure they're gonna drink 25 gallons a day. That means I need 1,000 gallons a day. They're probably gonna be in that area for seven to 10 days. So I need 10,000 gallons worth of water, which I'm collecting 12, which is fine, okay? So this is the barn where it's at. This is that yellow polygon is the water area or the roof area that I'm collecting the water off of. A one inch rainfall event captures 3000 gallons. We normally get four inches a month, which means I get 12,000 gallons worth of water by the time those cows get back. And so I'm ready to water them again. So this water right here is right there, okay? And so I ripped that thing out and I put in a tire. So there's the one in the background. I put in a tire water, which allows at least 10% of the herd to graze. Nice, clear water. That water is from the roof, okay? We put in geotextile fabric, heavy traffic pad, hardened the whole thing. And then now with this water that I'm collecting off the roof, I'm making a direct impact on the monthly water bill for this farm, okay? Because I'm collecting free water. This lane that we created, all right, so there's the water right there. We created a lane to basically move these animals from one place to another. I have plenty of room to put in concentrated diets in these portable bunkers. There's a brand new calf. We take that heifer and that calf, we put them in the barn, okay? Before I arrived, there was one cow, and just as an example, one cow and a pair of twins had this entire floor area, and they had two waters with two holes on each one. The floor was pugged really, really bad with this nasty clay. It was, it was like twisting your ankles. I hauled all that off. I put down geotextile fabric and rock. I put down this plastic grid just to try that out. I put down class I sand in that and compacted it, okay? Put in cross gates in here to create additional pens. Now these waters are divided in half. So now I can have more animals in here, more groups, okay? Now I got, a, I got a heifer in here, I got a pair of twins. We can put the ear tags in there. We can identify this cow or this calf with this, this animal right here, this cow or this heifer, whatever, okay? I've got, I had this open piece of concrete and now you can see that we've, we've got this floor area done. So now this is a maternity barn, okay? The open piece of concrete, I put in this manger structure, raised it six inches above the ground where the cattle stand. I put in the sewer pipe so the pipe or so I can put in roll bales and slide them back really easy. So now I've got cattle that can access this, you know, three sides of this manger. What you want is, is access, okay? So when I look at this structure right here, this structure has got access to one, oh, sorry. It's got access to one, two, three different gates, which means this structure has got access to three different pastures, okay? Which is great. But wait, there's more. I've got the animals in the barn so I can open up this gate and it jams into that post. 
This gate jams up into that post, so I can actually feed the animals in the barn off the same structure while the rest of the herds got access to the other part of the structure, okay? This is it. When it was being used, we've scraped this manure off. You can see where we're taking it around to the side. That manure goes into this bin structure right here where we're holding and containing that manure, okay? So this is the structure when we got started. They had a they had this pasture and they got a little makeshift lane right here that doesn't even come up to the barn alley, okay? I don't know how that works. And then you got an open piece of concrete that wasn't being used, okay? So then now we've got a lane that connects one, two, three different pastures, okay? I've got the feeding area right here. I've, and so what we've got is, is this opportunity to have heifers in this field where the, where the owner the, or the manager can look out his kitchen window and see 80, 90% of the field. When these animals come up, if they have calved, will calve, get ready to calve, they go in the barn for 24 hours, okay? After they calve, we move them across here to the, what we call the nursery. After we get a concerted group of say 20 animals, we can move them over to the next field. But what you have is, is a hub that has access to three different fields multiple activities are going on in this one location, okay? So going back to this, that design I just showed you, this is that design from 1910 showing a winter feeding area having access to three or six pastures with a lane. What I've got with what I just showed you is just half of this. It's just the top three pastures with the winter feeding area. Imagine the productivity if I had another three pastures, okay? So I'm looking at this structure, this is what it is. I've got the lane, access to three different locations, tire water, I got a building, I got a roof that collects water, that water goes into these tanks, that water goes into this water to water these animals. I got an old silage wall that we use as a windbreak. I've got hay stored right here, which again, how far do I have to drive? Not very far. I got storage for my manure, I got, I got a runoff control for any kind of nutrients coming off the concrete pad, okay? This is the soil survey for that farm that I just showed you that was done in 1976. It's got four inches of topsoil. Organic matter content is low. It's droughty, restricted root layer, silty clay loam, slightly sticky and plastic, narrow ridges, 12 to 20% slopes breaking off in the 20 and 30. It's severely eroded. Runoff is rapid. Permeability is low. Let me tell you, if it rains an inch on this farm, I will only capture a 16th of it because the rest of it is running off. So what we've done is, is we went into these vegetative filter areas and we ripped it, okay, with a, with a ripper and just basically ran that toolbar through there, which heaves up the soil, okay, which basically creates a berm going down that hillside. So there's the ripping right there that we did. You can see those lines. And then I can come in there and I can intercede that if I want with some taller grass or any kind of interceding grass I wanna use. And this is that filter strip area. And it's just kind of deep and lush. And that's where the cows want to be. They, I mean, they got the opportunity to be in here or in here and they want to be in here, okay? I got a creep gate and a regular gate. I can let the calves have access to it. I can open it up and I can let the mamas in too, but I can also close it off to keep that grass thick and lush, which is the same concept of this. And then there's that grass right there in this particular area down below this impervious concrete absorbing all those nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, before it leaves the farm. So thank you very much for your time. If you feel like you're getting ready to pass out, just uh, put your knees, head between your knees, maybe breathe into a paper bag, and I will take any questions that you all have. Well, Steve, thanks. That, <clears throat> even though it uh, was a lot of information, it, it went by really quickly for me because I was just staying engaged and keeping up with what you're talking about. So I, I appreciate that. Um, I do want to let everyone know that, uh, you know, if you planned around the timing of this and you need to, to log off, uh, please feel free to do that. Uh, just remember to fill out the survey link that, that you'll receive by email tomorrow. It's an automatic uh, survey that will send out, I think, at the start time of the, the seminar for tonight. Um, but please just uh, go ahead and fill that out so we have a record of your attendance uh, when you get it. Otherwise, if you stay on for some Q&A here for a few minutes, uh, you'll get the survey link just right after um, uh, Courtney ends the uh, webinar and you can fill it out here tonight just right after we're done. So, um, Steve, one of the things that, that came up uh, quite a bit in the Q&A box when you were talking about uh, managing hay feeding uh, was a question about unrolling. 
And yes. I think you may have mentioned it a little bit here and there, but a lot of questions about it. Just wanted to get your take on un unrolling hay um, and how that compares to some of the other methods that you talked about feeding. Yeah, un unrolling hay is, is a tool for the toolbox, that most definitely. Uh, it works really well when you have uh, frozen ground. Um, uh, no, no doubt about it. But if you don't have frozen ground, then you're actually, um, you could be, you could be creating some ruts and some compaction, some erosion, some, some soil loss, that type of things. Um, I have different people that feed at different rates. I have some producers that make the cows clean it all up. I have other producers that say that they waste a whole lot of hay by unrolling it. It, it all depends on your management strategy. It also depends on what kind of body conditioning score you want to have at the end of it. Um, at the end of the day, I mean, the whole point of, of baling hay is to conserve it for later feeding. And if you're going to waste it through some of these methods, no matter if it's unrolling or which could be or might not be, uh, what was the whole point in bringing it up? If you're going to leave it on, you know, because I got some people go, well, if they don't eat it, that's going to be organic matter that's going to soil. Well, that's another way of doing it, but why harvest it if you're just going to waste it? So, but it does work well. It's a good tool to have in the toolbox if the ground is frozen. And it also depends on your herd size and how often you want to do it, but it also requires you to go in the field. So if you want to use it, fine. Yep. And I've seen some creative tools for uh, unrolling or windrowing unrolled hay and, and those kinds of things. Um, you know, some extra um, expense in, in machinery and those kinds of things that, that uh, you might be able to, to put into infrastructure and make the same kind of impact, but uh, definitely a lot of discussion around enrolling and I've seen some folks that get good at it and, and manage it well, just like you said. Uh, had a couple of uh, technical questions. Uh, one was on uh, geotextile material. Can you just talk about some specifics of what you like to use? Uh, yeah, I get my, I get uh, eight ounce fabric is what I typically get. There's, there's probably about 12 or 13 different parameters that they actually evaluate geotextile fabric on. There's puncture strength, shear strength, uh, you, you know, a lot of different things. But what I like to use is, is the, the non-woven, okay? Because the woven is very slick and, and it's also uh, waterproof. So if you put it underneath a, a rock layer and it's on a slope, what you can get is, is this underground movement of water and it'll wash that rock clean off the, uh, off the filter fabric. So the woven is, is not what I like to use because it's too slick and it's waterproof. The, the regular filter fabric of eight ounce allows the water to, to go through um, or to infiltrate and to pass through. It provides separation because what you're doing is, is you're separating rock from soil, okay? Those are two different, entirely different materials. Rock is what we call a non-cohesive material, which means water does not attach to it. Soil is a cohesive material. And when you have clays, that's where you get the stickiness, the suction, uh, the slipperiness and so on and so forth. So the whole point of the filter fabric is to separate the rock from the fabric or the soil, from the rock from the soil. Because if I take, if I don't use the filter fabric and I apply 10 pounds of rock to 10 pounds of soil, I'm going to end up with 20 pounds of mud. You have to have the filter fabric in there. So the, the non-woven basically has a lot of uh, resistance to it, which allows that rock to basically not move laterally in, in other different directions. Um, I mentioned the separation. Let's see, it also provides the, uh, the reinforcement to basically spread out that hoof load over a greater area. So it's the way to go. So uh, I, you know, I, you can get links of, well, it comes in all different kinds of sizes depending on your application. I've seen it sold in, I think, six foot wide rolls, uh, 12 foot, 10 foot, 15. My, my usual rule of choice is 15. Uh, because I'm usually using it for lanes and driving trucks and animals down that. That's usually what they come out to be. And I think I covered all that about the fabric, unless I missed something, but that's... No, that, yeah, way more than I've ever known about it. Oh, <laughs> that's yeah. great. And, it, it, and the specifics in the question you, you got too, that, so that's great. I just, I'm going to ask a few more questions if you don't sure. mind, Steve. Oh. Uh, just w before I do that, I want to remind everybody that, you know, again, if you have uh, planned on a, a specific end time and need to log off, that's not going to affect your attendance uh, here. Just remember to, to fill out the survey when you get that via email uh, tomorrow. Um, one uh, question here, and I, actually on one person I asked it, but I'm just gonna take, um, I guess, moderator privilege and ask it because it's something I th I've thought about a lot. Um, and, and from an engineer's perspective, I've just never had an opportunity to pick, pick an engineer's mind on this, but 
I'm thinking about the mud at the edges of whatever feeding area you set up yeah. uh, and the best way to d distribute that or to handle it, you know, you're inevitably going to have some mud coming up to it. How do you handle that in general? Um, okay. So, okay. Not being smart or anything, but like if I pour a concrete pad, I can pour it any size I want. Okay. But as soon as an animal steps off of it, I'm going to have a mud hole. Sure. That's just the way it is. The way our soils are um, formed in, in Tennessee and Kentucky, it, you know, it's basically a, a wind deposited soil or alluvial soils or whatever. And the amount of clay content we have and the amount of moisture that we have, there is no way you cannot produce mud in the state. Okay, period. Now, having said that, what I normally do is, is let's say I do that, uh, that concrete structure, that 36 by 50. What I'll do is, is on the approaches to it, I'll do what I call a snow cone, where I'll basically, I'll put out a, a, a gravel pad going out from that. And it depends on the herd size, how many animals you have and so on and so forth. But I'll come out 15 or 20 feet from that and basically do a, a, a angular pad that comes up because cattle don't walk in 90 degree angles. So I, I basically give them approach that they can walk up to, to get on that gravel and then get on the concrete. When I have concrete and gravel interfacing, as far as button up together, I will place the con I will place the gravel about an inch and a half taller than the concrete. Okay, when I first place it, because after you get animals on it, what's going to happen is is it's going to level out. Okay, so the, what's really going on is if you got concrete and the animals have to step off, what she is doing is is she's transferring her entire load onto one foot, and that's a tremendous amount of force. So if you've got the gravel that's above the concrete or level with it, then basically you've got a nice smooth transition to get her off of. But after I go out 15 or 20 feet, I'm done. After any mud out beyond that is okay. Same thing with like a water. Um, I, I went to multiple farms and I measured from the center of the water to the, the mud puddle that's created. And that dimension is basically eight feet, okay? So when I do a water that's going to be used in the wintertime, I want at least an eight foot or a 10 foot concrete pad for them to stand on and, and do whatever they need to do, whether it's eating or drinking. Okay, so there's that. Another thing, let me add this too. If you're doing a, a pad, a concrete pad or, or just any kind of pad for animals to stand on, typically cattle like to eat and do their business flat. Okay, but, but we utilize cattle on hill slopes to basically eat the grass. But as a rule of thumb, do not ever pour a concrete pad flat, okay? Uh, if you want it to drain, it needs to be at least a 2% slope. If it's going to have manure or bedding on it, it needs to go up a little bit higher, but no higher than five, okay? And that allows that, that water to drain either off an impervious concrete layer, and even gravel pads can become impervious. And so you want that moisture to basically move away. So there's that. But yeah. Yeah. It's a good question. No, that, yeah, and it's something I've thought about. And that uh, specifically what you said about, you know, cat, where you've measured how far the mud goes from a, a, a water, that's perfect answer to what I was saying. Just how far do you need to go to disperse that, you know, con foot compression to, yeah. to make it? That's good. Uh, while so, you're so on concrete and you mentioned a lot about concrete, uh, what's your preferred method for uh, reducing uh, foot slipping on concrete? Uh, I like to uh, broom it. Uh, put a broom finish on it. And by broom, um, I don't mean a regular, I don't mean a sweeping type of broom. The brooms I'm thinking about is the, the old style bristle brooms with the nine inch bristles that were really, really hard. Those types of bristle brooms put on a, a nice, uh, a good finish on there. Uh, if you had to, you can use a, a, a stiff rake. Uh, the problem with concrete and, and the, the abrasiveness of it is, is you don't want to go too abrasive where cattle are on it all the time, where they're gonna ground their hoof down to the heel. Conversely, you definitely don't want them slipping on it where they're gonna slip a hip or you know that kind of thing and fall and break a leg. Um, but yeah, the thing about concrete, as far as being in a barn, as far as bedding and that kind of thing, you have to use bedding with concrete, in my opinion, because concrete to me is a thermal conductor. When an animal lays down on concrete, a third of her body is against that concrete. If you don't think that's sucking heat out of her, just walk into your garage with no shoes on. I mean, it's, it's, it's brutal. So any kind of impervious surface like concrete needs to be uh, 
bedded for insulated purposes and, and cattle comfort, thermal and physical comfort, in my opinion. That's just that no, a lot of people don't like to do that, but that's, that's, that's how it has to be. Every other animal species beds. So there's that. Another thing too, before I forget, on this, the gravel stuff, something that we've been playing around with up at Eden Shale is installing what's called um, mechanical concrete. So we get semi-truck semi tires, okay? And there's a company that'll, when they recycle them, they'll basically, they'll cut the sidewalls out, okay? And the sidewalls are used for like holding down the plastic on silage bunkers and that kind of thing. But you can take that, that tread cylinder that's left over and you can excavate out your soil, take out nine inches of soil, put down your filter fabric and lay those tire cylinders down and then backfill them with gravel, okay? And then compact it. And so when you go to clean that off, okay, uh, you're not gonna haul away any gravel because the, the thickness of that rubber is about an inch and a half thick. And so it creates all these, these you know, surfaces that basically a bucket cannot gouge into the floor and, and dip it into that rock. The other thing of beauty about those tire, tire cylinders is, is like, let, let's say you're driving down I-65, you know, I-75, whatever, and your, your vehicle tires are in a rut, both of them, because basically the, the, the pavement is deformed based on that load. Well, the tire cylinder basically works to, to counteract that because there's nowhere for that rock to go left and right, okay, that lateral pressure. So it's, it's and I've been buying them for like a buck a piece, and I think that they'll probably extend the longevity of a, of a regular gravel pad by several years because mine usually only lasts about five to seven. So this is a way of incorporating a different product that'll extend the lifespan of, of, of that pad, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it does. And it's a lot less um, cost than I thought you were going to say that it's, uh, I guess they're just trying to get rid of them from a recycling perspective. That's good. Yep. Dude. Uh, and they're about, they're about 40 inches in diameter. So another thing that we just did, we, I mean, we just did it because at Eden Shale, these animals have got to walk up a 30% slope. Well, that's basically a staircase, okay? I mean, that's the same slope. So we have issues trying to get the animals up to our feeding areas because they can't reach it. So one of the things we did was basically took a, um, a bucket, you know, a, a backhoe bucket or, a, you know, track hoe bucket, whatever, and basically cut a, a, a notch basically in the soil and basically made a path, put filter fabric down in there and made a, a one column tire path that we back filled with rock just to get the cattle from that mud area that they have to traverse through, which is several hundred feet, just to get them up to the feeding area and then back out to the field. And we just tried that out this year. It's, it's gonna work, it's working great. Yeah, that, those are some neat ideas and stuff I just don't uh, run into quite a bit. And just to say a few words again about Eden Shell, there's some questions on here talking about um, folks on really hilly farms and trying to make the best out of that. And I'll just tell everybody here that I'm familiar with Eden Shell. Did uh, did some work up there when I was in school at UK, and it is as hilly as you can make a farm. And what was it you said before we started, uh, Steve? It was. Uh, I, I said if you can. I said if you can farm at Eden Shell, you can farm on Mars. That's right. Yeah, and and it can be done. And and watching the videos, I'd encourage everybody to to um, go to um, a lot of the videos that they have of Eden Shell virtual tours and, and Steve talking about some of this to get some. Uh, more information on it. So I'll ask you one last question. I kind of, uh, I'll combine some uh, here on that, uh, thinking about uh, cost and payback of, of some of these applications. And I think this, uh, this series of questions came in as you were talking about uh, hay feeding, but it maybe could apply to any. Um, so knowing that most of our producers in both states are going to be somewhere in that 30 to 50 cow range. Yes. And, and quite a few that are smaller than that. Um, just thinking, you know, on a one bull unit, uh, when you're talking about the investment and the payback over, you know, two to five years, uh, those kinds of things, does that uh, have like a, a, a average farm size in mind? Is that what you're thinking? Uh, no, I mean, not to my knowledge. I mean, because basically, I mean, building, building stuff on a square foot basis is the same, whether you're building something that's going to cover one square foot or versus 10,000. I mean, the building cost per square foot, you're looking at you know, five dollars to put something under a roof. You're looking at four seventy-five to put something in concrete with reinforcement. Those those figures are, are on a square foot basis, whether you're dealing with one or infinite. So, and then the other thing too, I, I didn't show it either, but 
there's something else that we did at Eden Shale was took one of these old tobacco barns that we're not using. Uh, it was used for junk storage. And I took the center alley and basically made it in the entire alley into a self feeder. So we've got 32 roll bales in there where those cattle have access to all 32. And when they start eating, they can feed until they're done with that 32. Then we can move that rack back because it's on rails and we can reload it again. I did that one for about $3,500. And that's that right now we're serving 22 calves. But the thing about it is, is we will feed those, those 20, 20 some odd animals for, for what? 45 days without hauling another roll bin. Conversely, I got lots of producers that are moving a bale or two every other day. So this is one of those things where you don't have to fire up a tractor for 30 days. To me, I mean, you're taking a barn that wasn't being used. Now it's being used as a storage structure for hay. And now it's being used to sell feed. And it was already there. So yeah. I should, probably should have showed some stuff on it. But and folks, I could have talked on this stuff for days. I'm sorry I went as long as I did. But there you go. Yeah. That's great. And I, I really appreciate you um, being willing to, to give us this much information. And, and I could a literally sit here and ask you questions for days, but um, I'll have to, to shut it off somewhere. So um, with that, I'll just say thanks again, Steve. I mean, just Thank sincerely, you. we all really appreciate this. Got a lot of positive feedback in the chat and Q&A. Um, I'll tell everybody watching that if, if you have more questions on this, uh, please reach out to your, your county UT extension agent. Um, a lot of them will have experience with this. Like I said, Matt Webb, uh, one of yeah, our all the agents there in Marshall County. These guys are, are well connected in this and, and stay up to date on this specifically to be able to answer your questions. And, and if they can't answer them directly, they'll get a hold of the, the right person that can. So um, it, remember to um, you know finish the uh, survey as we sign off here. It'll pop up and you can click the link uh, on the survey to, to evaluate tonight and give us some feedback. And uh, with that, thanks again, Steve. I really appreciate it and look forward to some more questions from Tennessee, okay? Okay, okay. Right. Take, Take care. care, see you, thank you.